Hi, today we're going to talk about the center of mass. We have three goals today. Well, we're going to start by just defining what the center of mass is and why it's so useful to us. We'll talk about the velocity of the center of mass and we will connect this concept of the center of mass to momentum conservation. So first of all, what is the center of mass? So it is a point that represents the average location for the total mass of a system. So let's say you have a system like this. We have a meter stick and we've just glued three objects of varying masses to this meter stick at the points shown. If you want to find the center of mass of that sort of uh, system, then you can use this equation here. And this is one dimensional, so uh, all we need to do is specify the x coordinates of each piece. So the x position of the center of mass is the mass of the first object times its x coordinate plus the mass of the second object times its, its x coordinate, etc., etc., divided by the total mass of the system. By the way, if you actually want to calculate the center of mass of the system shown in the picture, it's uh, given in the book. Let's have a look at the section in the book. So often we're dealing with complicated objects like this funny meter stick or a car or anything. And we often treat that object like a point. And if we do that, the point we use is the center of mass. And this kind of indicates why we do that why we choose the center of mass to be the representative point for the object. So we have some kind of baton here. And I've put three lights on the baton, a white one, a red one, and a blue one. And the blue one is, uh, sorry, the red one's right in the middle, so it is marking the position of the center of mass. So this baton gets thrown up in the air. And so the baton itself, every single point on it, follows a pretty complicated path, except for the center of mass. So you see the center of mass follows a beautiful parabola. It's the one point that behaves just like a baseball does when we toss that up into the air. The baseball follows a lovely parabola too. So in many cases we can sort of reduce that baton to the center of mass and say well let's understand at least the parabolic part of the motion which is much much less complicated than the crazy swirling motions that any other point on the baton will follow as the baton twirls through the air. So it's a very powerful simple, simplifying idea, this idea of the center of mass, as the center of mass follows a pretty simple trajectory unlike every other point on this object. So now let's turn to the velocity of the center of mass. So to start with you can define an equation, you can write down an equation for the velocity of the center of mass, which is very similar to the one that gives us the position of the center of mass. Oh, by the way, while I'm thinking about it, that one that we get had for x cm, if you're in two dimensions, then there's a comparable one for y cm, the y coordinate of the center of mass. That would be y cm is m1, y1 plus m2, y2, etc., etc., over the total mass. Okay, so here we're doing the velocity. So now we, instead of x's or y's, we've got v's. So you take the momentum, actually, of each component of your system, add up as vectors all those momenta, divide by the total mass, that's the velocity of the center of mass. And if you look at this, you could actually put the total mass Instead of putting it in the uh, denominator in the equation, you could multiply both sides by the, the uh, total mass. Then you'd have total mass times VCM. Well, that is equal to the right-hand side, which is the sum of all the individual momenta of the different pieces of the system. So it's the total momentum. So we're really saying the total momentum of the system equals the total momentum of the system. Okay? So the total mass times the velocity of the center mass gives you the total momentum of the system, just like adding up as vectors, the momenta of each piece of the system gives you the total momentum of the system. So 
in an isolated system, that means, in other words, no net external force acts on the system, then the uh, linear momentum inside the system can't change, so the velocity of the center of mass can't change. Now we can apply Newton's laws to the object, and remember we treat this as a point mass located at the center of mass often. That's our simplifying principle we can do with the center of mass. Okay, so more things with the center of mass. So this is basically what we were talking about before. No net external force acts. Then there's no acceleration, so the velocity must be constant of the center of mass. Now, individual parts of the system can change. They can run into each other, for instance. Okay, so if you have two carts colliding with each other, or a, two cars on the street colliding with each other, they can each change their own velocities, but if there's no net external force acting on the system, the velocity of the center of mass has to remain the same. Okay? A sort of uh, simpler way to say this, or at least a shorter way to say that, is that internal forces cannot change the position of the center of mass. So piece one might exert a force on piece two, but piece two exerts an equal and opposite force back on piece number one. Pieces one and two are parts of the system. So they change what each other do. Okay, so that changes V1 and V2, but it changes V1 and V2 in such a way that the velocity of the center of mass remains the same. Okay, so we'll go through kind of a nice uh, pictorial representation of this. So in this case, we're going to have these two objects collide. They have equal mass, these two guys. The red one is initially at rest, and the yellow one is going to move to the right and hit the red one. Okay, so here we go. What we want to know is, what is the center of mass doing before the collision? So think about that, what do you think it's doing? And what's the center of mass doing after the collision? Okay, so there's our collision, we'll investigate that. Okay, so remember these two things are equal mass. If we could do the same kind of analysis in a system where the masses were different, and you might think about how that would change the results, but we'll start with the simple case of equal mass. Okay, so let's try it again. So now we have some little white square shows up in the picture here. That is representing the center of mass. Okay, so before the collision, we have the center of mass being halfway between the objects, and the center of mass velocity is half that of the moving object, and that is only true because these guys are going at equal mass. Only have equal mass, sorry. And after the collision, the neat thing is the center of mass is unaffected by the collision until the red one kind of runs into a, a wall at the right and then that produces an external force acting on the system which actually changes the center of mass momentum. But throughout the collision the center of mass motion is unchanged. Okay, It's only when a net external force acts and you saw the red thing bounce off some hidden wall and that's producing an external force that changes the center of mass momentum. We're going to look at this exact same. Look, so here's a summary of that. So the center of mass motion changes only when a net external force acts on the system. It doesn't change when the yellow and red guys hit each other. It only changes when something external to the system acts on one or both of the particles. Okay, so we'll look at this again. And what I've done here is really kind of almost purely hidden the balls so you can focus on what the center of mass does. And it's a little jerky because of the video. Everything really is smooth here, but you just focusing on what the center of mass does, you can't tell when the collision occurs. So the center of mass actually doesn't even notice that a collision has occurred. It keeps doing exactly what it was doing uh, before the collision, after that collision happens. Okay, so that's how things work in one dimension. So now we'll do the same kind of thing in two dimensions to see what happens. Okay? So again, we'll think about what the center of mass does. And these guys, again, have equal masses. Okay, so before the collision, what does the center of mass do? You notice these guys are not... They're off-center now. Okay, so this is an off-center collision, so you get a two-dimensional result afterwards. What's the center of mass doing now after the collision? 
So let's think about that. Again, this is a bit of a special case because we have equal masses here, but you can also do some general things that would apply for, um, for cases where the masses are different. Okay, so let's see what happens before the collision. Once again, we find the center of mass is halfway between the objects, and its velocity is half that of the moving object. That, again, is only because the two objects have equal mass. After the collision, amazingly, the center of mass is unaffected by the collision again. Okay, the two objects themselves move off vertically. One has a downward component of velocity, one has an upward component. But the center of mass velocity has no vertical component at all before or after the collision, okay? And you notice that the center of mass kept drifting to the right, drifting to the right, until the red object ran into the wall again. You can't see the wall, but it's there on the right of the screen, just hidden. Then we had an external force acting on the system, acting on the red ball in particular, and that reversed the direction of the, uh, it, uh, well, it actually, let's say, changed the direction of the center of mass. The center of mass went to the left there because of the left going force acting on the ball when it hit the wall. Okay, once again we'll see this with the, um, the balls almost completely hidden so you can focus on what the center of mass is doing. And if you just focus on what the center of mass does, you cannot tell when the collision occurs. The center of mass keeps doing what it's doing before the collision and after the collision that's totally unchanged until a net external force acts on the system which uh, happens now okay so the red ball just bounced off the wall on the right and that reversed the direction of the uh, center of mass velocity okay so that's kind of a neat thing so the individual pieces of the system are certainly changing their momenta but the momentum of the center of mass is not affected at all. Okay, so this is kind of a powerful concept. It's connected to momentum conservation, and it really allows us to take a complicated system and at least start by analyzing it in a very simple way, as if it's just a single object, and then we know how to analyze single objects. Okay, we just do projectile motion to a single object or simple momentum conservation, things like that. Okay, so that's our introduction to the center of mass.